I want to turn to the book of Esther. Perhaps when we talk about Esther, the most well-known passage in the book is found in chapter four, verse 14, where Esther's cousin and guardian Mordecai says to her, who knows but that you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Of course, we all know that verse. And I've heard lots of great messages based on the scripture over the years. But I've found that most of those messages, most of those sermons miss the point completely because they miss the context of Mordecai's words. Let's take a closer look at the circumstances surrounding this passage, and then we'll see something. Mordecai's message to Esther was not some feel-good motivational speech, but rather it was a sobering and alarming ultimatum. Esther was a young Jewish woman. She was born into a broken family. She was a minority in an oppressive society. The odds were against her right from the start. But almost overnight, Esther went from rags to riches, from poverty to the palace, and she became the wife of King Xerxes I, making her one of the most powerful women in history. Irony seems to fill the pages of the Book of Esther. Just as Persia has unknowingly crowned a Jewish queen, the king's visor, a man named Haman, is plotting a diabolical scheme to exterminate the Jewish race through a bloody massacre. There is only one Jew in the land who is in a position to intervene on behalf of her people. It's Esther. But it seems as though the pleasures of the palace had begun to intoxicate her. She begins to struggle with what course of action to take. As Esther looked around at the beautiful palace that was now her home, with its luxuries, pleasures, conveniences, and the wealth she had come to enjoy, it must have been difficult for her to imagine throwing it all away in some misguided attempt at heroism. She knew that taking this matter to the king would force her to risk everything she had including her very life. Perhaps a more subtle approach would be best. Maybe she should just lie low for a while and wait to see how things would play out. Perhaps at some point she would have an opportunity to put in a good word for the Jews without jeopardizing herself. After all, what good would she be to anyone if she were dead? But Mordecai, Esther's cousin, sensing her internal struggle, sent her this message. Do not flatter yourself that you shall escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from elsewhere. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let's look at those words that Mordecai sent to Esther once again. He said, don't flatter yourself. Isn't that interesting? Don't flatter yourself that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance shall arise for the Jews from elsewhere. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows but that you have come into the kingdom for such a time. Is this. In other words, Mordecai said, Esther, don't flatter yourself. You're not in the palace because you're so beautiful or special or wonderful. You've been placed by the hand of God in the position you are in because you are part of a strategic plan that's much bigger than you are. So Esther, for you to stand up and speak out on behalf of your people is not something over and above the call of duty. It's actually the very reason that God put you in the palace in the first place. And then Mordecai went on to emphasize the severity of the situation. He said, essentially, Esther, if you try to protect yourself and your position at the expense of the divine purpose, God will replace you and you will be the one that's destroyed. Now, maybe you think that I don't have any right to speculate as to what's going on in Esther's heart and mind, but I do it because of two things. Number one, because of what I see plainly implied there in the text, but also because it's a, because of what I see happening every day in the Western world. Our comforts and conveniences 
have often made us complacent and indifferent to a dying world. We're often afraid to do anything that might disturb our pampered, cozy little lives. One man told me, he said, I can't talk about Jesus at work because if I do, I'll lose my job. I've heard others say that there are two topics they won't discuss at work, politics and religion. But my friend, the gospel is not some side issue. Have you ever thought that maybe the very reason you have that job in the first place is because you are a strategic part of a divine purpose? God put you there, God gave you your job, and he gave it to you for a reason? My friend, if you're not willing to be a witness in your workplace, don't be surprised if God takes that job from you and gives it to somebody else who isn't ashamed of the gospel. You know, I've seen people drop hundreds of dollars at restaurants or at football games or on unnecessary luxuries at the mall. Ladies, another pair of shoes, another purse. But when the offering plate goes around in church, they immediately begin to complain. All they ever do in this church is ask for money, they say. And then if they do drop a couple measly dollars into the plate, they feel like they've been very generous. But my friend, the money in our bank accounts is not ours. It all belongs to God in the first place. He is not only the source of all our provision, but he's also the one who has given us the very ability to create the wealth that we have. And God hasn't blessed us just so that we can consume those resources on our own selfish whims. He's blessed us so that we can be a blessing. That's the reason that you have those resources in the first place. So my friend, if you aren't willing to bless God's kingdom with a cheerful heart, don't be surprised if he takes those a means and resources and gives them to somebody else who will be a good steward. If God's entrusted you with money, if he's entrusted you with other resources, you need to realize that he didn't give those to you because he likes you more than other people. He gave them to you because he expects you to be a channel through which those resources can flow. Yes, it's true that when water flows through a pipe, the pipe also gets wet. And when God's blessings flow through you, you will also be blessed personally. But don't make the mistake of thinking that you're being blessed because you're so special or wonderful or intelligent or talented. Think about what Mordecai said to Esther. Don't flatter yourself. You're not any better than the poorest beggar in the lowliest gutter. God hasn't blessed you because he loves you more than others. He's blessed you for a purpose, and your fulfilling of that purpose is not a side issue. It's the very reason that he gave you those blessings in the first place. If you won't do what God's called you to do, He'll find somebody else who will do it with joy.